Aloha, I'm Joshua Cooper and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around our world on Think Tech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, and Moana Nui Akea. Today's episode, we're focusing on setting a social and international order, Article 28, the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Article 28 is so important because it says everyone is entitled to a social and international order in which the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration can be fully realized. And the Universal Declaration of Human Rights provides the power of ideas to initiate change in the world. The UDHR outlines opportunities for a new direction rooted in inherent dignity and inalienable rights for dynamic sustainability and solidarity. And the UN Sustainable Development Goals reinforces those original rights in the UDHR provides the opportunity for a social and international order. I'm so honored to be joined with a colleague who has just returned from the UN High Level Political Forum, which is where the UN Sustainable Development Goals are always being discussed, but also where the Voluntary National Review takes place that actually allows countries to share how they're actually setting up this international order and really reinforcing rights with the UN and Global Goals. Yotsna, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Josh, for having me here. Could you share with us a bit what inspires you to participate in the UN Sustainable Development Goals and, more importantly, really looking at the importance of an international order that's rooted in solidarity and sustainability for all? Yeah, of course. Uh, since I belong to one of the countries of the global south and it's very important for us to uh to, to ensure the voices of the people that is heard at the global level because you know the unhlpf is uh, organized in the new york and it's uh, for half of the people in global south it's kind of dream to 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 travel to new york and you know forget speaking something or uh, forget keep um, representing the voices but it's, a, it's a, such a tough task so and that's one thing, but definitely we feel that, um, you know, the, the HLPF is, uh, have a lot of people, especially in the, uh, if you look at the United Nations, they are majority of people from the global north. And um, there are, I mean, we, I have been kind of uh, following HLPF past eight years, since 2016. And we have seen that how it has evolved over the time. So we felt that it's very important for us uh, to be the, to be here in New York and uh, kind of represent the voices because we speak a lot during our sessions here, right here in, in our region, the region that I belong to, that's South Asia. And then we also have some regional mechanism at the Asia-Pacific level. But um, uh, it's very sad to see that even the, the summary of the chair, even from the Asia-Pacific regional services, uh, uh, regional mechanism or regional uh, from the Asia Pacific region, hardly reaches HLPF. So, even from that point of view, it's, it gets very important for us to ensure what, how we have uh, worked hard to ensure that the voices of the people from the remotest region, remotest places on our in our region are heard, especially the voices of the marginalized vulnerable indigenous people lgbti we have lots of issues we have issues of infrastructure development just to start off we cannot even imagine competing with hawaii or any other you know uh, even some of the northern uh, countries uh, which we call northern but of the global south like singapore and japan we are quite far behind so i think it's very important for at least for us to not only share our concerns because we are also um, uh, one of those worst regions, especially South and Southeast Asia, in terms of shrinking civic space. So uh, governments are doing all their best uh, to 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 curb the freedom of expression association. So looking at all those things, I thought that you know UNHLPF or Sustainable Development Goal is a very important tool actually, or a, an event where we can speak freely. Um, and SDG especially where, um, you know, where the, all the SDGs are, are right-based. But if we talk strictly in terms of right-based, the governments might be having problem. But the SDGs have been signed by 193 countries or 
so you know they are committed to certain things so if we use the language of sdgs i think that makes us makes it easier uh, to to express our concerns and also we can be accountable and the governments could be accountable to what they have committed so that's the reason we thought that why not using this path instead of just keep telling that you know what you're supposed to do although we have not reached a long way um because um this is the uh, eighth year of sdgs implementation and there is hardly any vnr voluntary national review that talks about shrinking civic space so we have to go a long way but still at least we are talking the sdgs language for the governments to understand our uh, concerns no it's it's really important in that sustainable development goals reinforce the universal declaration of human rights which we know is celebrating its 75th anniversary but as you Absolutely. said it's just another chance to be able to speak truth to power and be able to share two things what questions we want to be posed to these governments but also what recommendations we have to actually actualize the UN 2030 agenda in our homelands and at that level can you share a bit i know you participate in the entire process how does this all begin we know countries say i volunteer and i will do my review and then there's a regional meeting in bangkok where we begin to start connecting people and really like you said challenge the shrinking civil society space and make sure that the civil society begins to coordinate together and learn from one another and then we all meet in new york in july at the un headquarters can you walk us through a bit how you assist people to be able to make sure that their voice is heard there at that highest level under the economic and social council there on the global goals yeah thank you so much for this because uh, uh it not only starts with the regional uh, deliberation but at the sub regional levels uh so uh there are sub regional de deliberation from at south south west asia uh south southeast asia central asia and northeast asia uh, and then pacific so there are five sub regional forum that takes place every year usually they start uh from the end of the september until october november like that but uh, this year because of the sdg summit uh, that comes every four year we call it um, you know this is one sort of ritual <laughs> in hindi uh, there is a term called kumbh kumbh mela kumbh is a very very big uh, uh, festival that happens every 12 years so everybody from people from all walk they go and attend it but this hlpf or so, sorry the high level uh, the sdg summit is no less than that you know so because of this uh, sdg summit this year they are going to delay the process of sub regional forum uh, usually uh, with that starts from september it might start start from the end of uh, october um, but it will go until um, november or maybe early december and uh, so it's a very good process actually because i do remember it didn't there was no sub regional forum in 2016 and 17 if i am if i remember well excuse me for my um, memory because um, there's a lot of deliberation but i think it started in 2018 and it was a good thing because we ensured that the people from sub regional participate directly in the un process so we have for south southwest asia the un office is in right is right here in delhi new delhi so we negotiate with them and then uh, you know it used to be a good uh, good good meeting actually where we had uh, lots of civil society people apart from the un and the government and uh, delegation and then we would uh, incorporate the feedback from each sub regional forum into the regional forum that happens in bangkok uh, usually in the end of may Uh, sorry in the end of the march uh, and then uh, they these all our deliberation are fed and so we ensure that uh, from all the regions of south uh, of asia and pacific are participating in this process so even the people who cannot participate even in bangkok they are participating in the sub regional forum and then uh, sub and then same with the regional forum and that uh, the outcomes that leads to the uh, high level political forum so this is the whole process where we ensure however again we have seen a lot of uh, 
changes in terms which is which are which is actually negative changes um because um you know the sub regional forums as i said that it used to be a very very good platform for the civil society to to voice up their opinion we used to have um a direct, uh, a one day civil society meet which is also happening now but post covid there has been lots of change uh, and uh, governments also use that digital divide for in their own favor and uh, so um, we see that the governments and the united nations they work together and uh, the un i mean we know that the un only i don't want to sound pessimistic but uh, they also voice the concerns of the countries that give them more money so that's one thing and uh, so we have started seeing that uh, during the sub regional forum a process of negotiation began between the civil society and the united nations sub regional offices which is really sad because they would say that we cannot um we cannot uh, uh, sponsor more than two or three or four civil society can you imagine suppose there are eight countries in south asia and five more from the west asia and you have you are inviting just two or three civil society on the other hand you are inviting all the member states all the 11 or 12 or 15 member states but so isn't it a tokenistic representation and uh, this has this was so much done that uh, last year in 2022 when the south southwest asia the sub regional forum was organized in pakistan uh, we started telling them that no you have to increase the number of civil society but they would not listen to us and we were the first sub region in asia pacific who boycotted the entire sub regional forum uh, we did not participate even the civil society were based in pakistan they did not participate we thought but we did not think both the both ways that the government would learn uh, but uh, it's highly unlikely it's okay for them uh, and then the sub region and then we also met the executive secretary of of uh, uh, uns cap amida and we told her the concern she said yeah i'm aware that um, you know people are not able to participate because of certain concerns and now they have started saying that we also have uh, the issues of funding we are funding restrictions so basically they are asking the civil society to fundraise uh, with them can you imagine united nation and any civil society organization or the uh, the civil society mechanism regional mechanism is there any comparison but um, there is no clarity how this alleged fundraise would take place who gets what share you know who has what say um, in uh, in inviting the participants but they have been telling this past two years that let's fund raise together but then they, i don't i really wonder where the uh, the uh, because when they are uh, inviting a lots of member states or all the member states why they don't talk about this financial restrictions but anyway that's one thing but uh, definitely we are into it there are other regions like north east asia and they are again north east asia are the north of the global south so they have obviously better they are better resource than the south and south east asia so they have better um, you know way of doing it they have more civil society uh, participating in the sub regional forum uh regardless we ensure that even if we are not participating our voices are heard in terms of uh, civil society statement because we organize our um uh a civil society forum even virtually uh and then we make sure that our uh, our statements are recorded so definitely there are the these are the processes the sub regional the regional and the high level and uh, there are very few people actually who could make it who make it, who are able to make it from the sub regional or the national to the high level but we ensure but still we ensure that the vnr countries which are participating they get uh, the uh, they get to come but again un has its own problems they have um, their own system so called system where they invite the people just two days before this uh, Uh, their presentation and most of the cases the civil society are not able to make to new york so ultimately some of us who are already there 
it's their responsibility actually to read the statement and make um, our cases stronger. Yeah. I really appreciate that full overview, especially of the sub-regional that happens in the fall, because countries usually announce they'll be reviewed. For you sharing with us the sub-regional, that's absolutely crucial. Then the regional that takes place usually in March, April, and then of course, July is the high level political form. As you said, it's almost like a fish swimming upstream. And those rare fish are the ones that are able to participate and to actually construct that social and international order because it's we civil society that almost makes all this possible, especially with the work that you do. Could you share a bit how you actualize these articles, especially Article 28, and what actions you're involved with to promote and protect human rights around the HLPF? Can you share what you do there? But then also, I know you're involved around G20 and other mechanisms. So any way that's possible for civil society to share their perspectives and make sure that the world represents what we, the people, want. So as a civil society participant, as the person, someone who has been part of this process for very long, I think it's very important for all of us to ensure that uh, the people who are, uh, um, who are uh, sharing their concerns, who want their voices to be heard, uh, but still, uh, their rights, their privacy is protected. I think this is something very important. We have seen in many countries, uh, especially from the Southeast Asia, where um, we work because as a, as a part as part of the VNR task group, um, MGUS task group, it's our job to uh, to work with various civil society to get you know, to get um, involved in the country level process with the civil society. And uh, also ensure that they have a very strong statement, uh, at least what they want to talk about the country to the what they want to share to this government in the UN. So these are some of those critical things that we do it. And, um, and so in some of the cases, the civil society, they say that, sorry, even if they are in the high level political forum in the New York, they are still very hesitant in uh, reading the statement because their governments are there right there so some of us maybe one of us would just go and read it on their behalf saying that we are reading this statement on behalf of the civil society we did in the case of Lao in the past singapore and uh, and uh, timor Leste. the cases could be different some some in some cases they are hesitant they are scared in some uh, or they could be you know intimidated actually um, but this is this happened also this year, and Joshua didn't know this. <laughs> so um, you you had to read the Singapore statement, and uh, which was very very tough. It talked only about the human rights, and the uh, uh, they they heard you, but uh, we heard that. Um, and then after that, the 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 someone from the some uh, someone from the state representation representation he came up to you and to me and asked uh, who wrote it, the name of the people involved. We tried to give them some answer because everybody, all the information are right there at the UN, there's a website, uh, but um, they wanted to know, and ultimately they complained to the UN DESA that it didn't talk about the SDGs, it talked more about the human rights. There are lots of things the governments have done, but then the civil society was very critical. But if I look from their point of view, I'm, I mean, from the point of view of the civil society, they do not have any platform where they can be heard not even the national or the regional platform. So I, I think they, when I asked them, can you change your statement a bit? And they said, you know, governments have all the good things to talk about, but who will talk about the human rights issues? Who will talk about the execution that takes place in the country? Nobody's there to talk about them. Nobody's there to talk about the issues of uh, poverty, inequality, or LGBTI, for example. So there are lots of things that the civil society feel that they need to talk about it. Maybe they are not using the language of SDGs, but still, they need to be heard. And uh, here we also play a role that uh, we ensure that in, no, in whatever, whatever happens, we read it. For, uh, and at least the state government, they, they hear it. Even if they com complain to the UNDS, that means they heard it, right? So we have, we have some success. So let's think positively. <laughs> and um, uh, so definitely these are there, these cases are there. Um, regarding the G20, yes, we have, again, I've been involved in the process since 2012 when there was no C20, there was no civil society, there was no civil 20 in Mexico, but in uh, the civil 20 started in from right uh, from St. Petersburg uh, 
Russia in 2013. And the Civil 20 is actually one of those official engagement groups of G20, which we have been demanding. We have been demanding uh, an independent state within us, us, an independent space within the G20 and which we got in 2013. But G20 is again what we see that it has become a very, very much country-led process uh, since it does not have any permanent secretariat. So it keeps moving. And we have seen how it moved from um, Japan to, to, to Saudi Arabia, to Italy in last five years, uh, to Italy. And then it came to, um, it came to uh, Indonesia. And then it came to India now. And now it will go to Brazil next year. So what we say, as I say, it's a very, very much country-led process. Well, but still, again, we cannot leave the space. There are people who think that, you know, uh, even if they're not listening to us, let's leave the space, let's create something. But, you know, many of us who really worked very hard, who fought for the space of the civil society as an official engagement group in the G20, I think it's not, it's not easy, it's, it's, it's not wise to leave, the pre to, to leave the place. At the same time, also supporting the people who are not uh, engaging officially. But we have seen some of the very tough states like Saudi Arabia, which has a severe human rights violation issues. Uh, but still, you know, we managed to go there, we, some of us, and we managed to raise concerns, although not strongly. But we still see that G20 is a very, very important space uh, where we, uh, and um, fortunately in, a Indian civil, in the Indian civil uh, G20, we managed to, uh, to have a working group on SDG 16 plus and promoting civic space, which was, which we really not, we did not think because there has been so much talks about that, you know, government of India or nobody would allow us, but actually we did it. And today uh, it's again, a, one sort of historic day, I would say that after all those fights that I'm doing, I'm fighting within the C20 and with the G20 here, they finally accepted our policy brief the way it was without making any change, because we said we do not want to compromise on this. And they did it. So, and we said that if, you know, if you do not listen, then um, you're not adhering to the principle of C20. And um, so it's, you know, again, I say there are marginal success. There are people who, are, who believe in the system. And, um, you know, and, and, and it would be a good thing that uh, some of the policy briefs, I mean, uh, there are some working groups like uh, SDG 16 plus, their working group on disability which is the first time in the C20, an independent disability group was established in Indian uh, Civil uh, 20. So again, this is a great success for the civil society, actually. Uh, so uh, it's not about the, uh, I mean, government, they recognize us. They recognize that, yes, the disability exists. They do not always need to be tied with the gender. They are independent one. Uh, the civil, the, the issues of promoting civic space, issues of corruption, which no government want to talk about. You know, we have, highlighted even those things. So I think these are some of the success and we are trying to link the SDGs and the G20 process. That's what we have been trying to do uh, past few years, especially also we did in uh, Indonesia, where we had a good working group on humanitarian and, and SDGs. But these are two very, very big topics. So this year we thought that why don't we do something in the SDG 6, uh, 16, which talks about the issues of uh, the freedom of expression association and especially uh, the the right to participate. Um, I think these are some of the very important thing, issues of corruption, transparency, accountability. So these are all there. And we are trying to tell them what we expect the G20 countries to kind of help and intervene in the SDGs uh, of Agenda 2030. How do we want to create some, some SDG fund, you know, where we can ensure the voices of communities are heard. They are getting some fund so that they can come to the SD uh, summit and they can you know, express their voices. Things are happening, moving at a very, 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 very slow pace, but things are happening. I am positive, uh, but not very much, but at least I would say that, yeah, we managed to do something, you know? No, oh, and it really brings up some really good points because you connect the fear of reprisals, but that we can't be frozen in fear that we must face. Absolutely what matters most and stand together in solidarity and how we did weave in SDG 16 for sure, but also SDG beyond peace, justice, and strong institutions, tackling corruption, so crucial, but then also reducing inequalities and gender justice and pulling all those together because that really reinforces what the UDHR calls for 
with that coalition of conscience centered around trust and transformation while honoring those values, vision, and voice. And I think if we look at what's important, we can see now the UN High Level Political Forum, it's that annual gathering of NGOs from around the world to influence the international institution of the UN and make an impact of the global goals on the ground. But as you shared, we have to take advantage of any global process to make sure that the social and international order reflects those values of the UN Charter of we the peoples and make sure it looks like what we desire. Yes, absolutely. And if on a final couple notes, can you share with us some of the major Shiro's heroes or human rights NGOs you think are doing great work in our region or around the world? And then we'll conclude briefly on your vision for the future of rights. You know, there are no dearth of heroes and Shiro's and a good organization, but uh, I'm like really very uh, concerned about their privacy, their security, because uh, there are very, 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 very good organization in all the countries, actually, I would say, in, um, especially in the, especially also coming from the Central Asia. You know, Central Asia is a very, very close state. And um, um, so there are many, uh, I can only say, uh, I'm not sure if I should name them, <laughs> but it might impact them, uh, their, uh, their security or some of their concerns, because the conditions are not good in our region especially South and Southeast Asia. I would have loved to give their names. Maybe sometimes I would write to you, but there are a lot. And I tell you, we would not be able to do anything without their help. As I said, that when we do the civil society statement, some of them are very, very strong statements. We do only because of them, but we ensure that their names, their pictures are nowhere. So uh, they are definitely there, Joshua. But uh, that's my concern. Um, but there is no dearth. I mean, because of those heroes and sheroes, we are we are able to we are managed we managed to bring their voices to the uh, high level political forum. Yeah, that's wonderful. And we know the UDHR Article Twenty Eight demands rights and freedoms are reflected in a social and international order that's echoed in the UN Twenty Thirty Agenda and the Paris Agreement. And the UNHLPF unites humanity around voluntary national reviews, measuring dozens of states for sustainable development goals. In conclusion, what do you see as the future of, especially as we're at halftime, and we're at halftime, and maybe the score is not exactly what we want, but we always know that we could win in the second half, and that's when most games are decided. What do you see as the future for, the, for human rights and the sustainable development goals? I wish the last sentence of yours, which was true, that the second half could be, maybe there was somehow we could bounce back. That would be an amazing thing. But as you know, that we are backsliding. The Asia Pacific region is come is badly backsliding. Uh, the goal thirteen is negatively actually going. Uh, Sixteen is re is stagnant or regressing slowly. But the the worst thing is goal thirteen. So which is not a good thing. And all this we can say on the basis of the variability of about forty five to fifty percent of the data that we are backsliding. If we had even eighty percent. Um, it would it would be more more far away uh, a dream to even achieve this. So according to the data that we have, uh, the Asia Pacific region will not achieve ST, uh, sustainable development goal until 2065. If you talk about gender goals, 200 years. So these are very very frustrating thing. But as I said, there are some small 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 things. I re I was listening to a VNR country this year. And they were telling that how in 2018 um, they had a uh, you know woman participation of one one woman participated, but next year it would be two women participated. We wanted to believe them okay from one to two to th to to three, but when the 50 percent comes, 50 percent women participated is going to happen in this birth of ours. I'm not even talking about 265 or 3000. I'm just saying that you know the way states are moving, they are simply disconnected with the reality of the people and this is such a sad thing because we are come on we are facing climate crisis it's happening now but why the governments are not trying to listen when we die the nature would not see the the political party uh, heads or uh, the the big people they are not drowning everybody would be drowned to death so i think our job as a civil society would be 
to keep voicing and that's what we are not we are not going back we are not uh, you know uh, uh, stepping back we are there we are going to go ahead we are going to tell them even if they don't like we are going to tell them and there are a lots of people's voices there are good cases studies also which could be replicated to other uh, other region so there are lots of things which is happening at the local level you know i would not say localizing of sdgs because it looks like definitely sdgs are uh, are the at, at the top level and those sdgs are being trying uh, being tried to be localized i would not not say i would rather say listen to the voices of indigenous people they have lots of knowledge exp experience expertise and wisdom uh, you don't need to go anywhere else if you listen to them uh, that's my last thing that i would want to request the people and the government and the member states thank you so much and that's true as we're about being brave and bold it's definitely indigenous peoples but it also provides a blueprint for a better world for all one that's looking Absolutely. at what you described sdg 13 of climate action but also climate justice and if we look at indigenous if we keep indigenous lands in indigenous hands we build to reach all 17 global goals on the ground thank you so much for joining and thank you for all the work that you do at the high level political forum at the G20 C20 and other international institutions to actualize article 28 Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.